welcome to Tasting the Peninsula. I'm Eric Little, I'm your host. This is Jeff Angel. It's a beautiful day. Not too common this type of year, but it's absolutely beautiful. And in this industrial park is one of the hidden gems of the Olympic Peninsula. One of our favorite breweries, Hood Canal Brewery. Yeah, we're right off the Hood Canal. And it's a, like Eric said, beautiful, warm day. So, shall we go ahead and head on in and meet Don Wyatt, the owner? I've always believed that the best wineries have dogs, and you can tell this is a good brewery because it's got a health department approved dog bowl. Uh, Don! Welcome to Hood Canal Brewery. Thank you. Great seeing you, Don. Thank you. Come on in. Well, thank you. Well, why don't you show us what we got going on in the house? All right, come on over to the production area. Well, this is a fermenter, and uh, the beer ends up in here after we uh, turn it into wort. Uh, we add the yeast to it here, and then it, it ferments. It takes about a week, and uh, with a hydrometer, we can check and see how it's doing. See, how, yeah, see what our gravity is. And then uh, when it gets done, when it stops making CO2 and alcohol, then we'll uh, cool it down. The yeast will drop out and end up at the bottom. And when we cool it down, there, it's cold enough that we can see the condensation lines on the bottom of the fermenter. And so we can see, yeah, how our yeast production's doing as well as, you know, we're making beer. Yeah, everything drops out, uh, all the yeast, and uh, it drops out here, and then we put it into another tank, this one here, and this is called the bright tank. And in this one, when, we're, when the beer is done in here, we transfer it over to here, add CO2 to it, uh, the yeast will that's in here will drop out. It has a couple of days in here after it's been in here. And uh, and then we can transfer it to kegs. And then, like I said before, uh, we can use the kegs however we need. We have a, a system for putting the CO2 into the product. And uh, uh, we, we check it to see how how much CO2 we have in there so that we're real consistent. And Ryan's done this now for quite a while. So um, he knows what he's looking for. And uh, I think we do a pretty good job of it. I can attest to that. All right, good. All right. So if you'd like, I can go through the process. Yes, I'd like. Okay. Um, we use malt that comes in these bags over here. So malt is basically sprouted barley that gets toasted, right? Um, so it can be toasted. This is Munich. This one actually has more color to it. Okay, this and is that what one, I was thinking. Yeah, this oh, is wow. the one that they run through and, and toasted it to the color that uh, they want it to have. And they have a process that the grains rolled in tumblers, kind of like a cement mixer. Mm -hmm. It has a heated jacket around it. So it's evenly. So it's evenly heated. And when the guy that does the toasting, uh, when he sees the color that he is looking for, um, then they cool it off as quick as they can. And then they'll process the grain uh, as they need uh, by bagging it up or, you know, whatever. So the brain gets put in that office. Right, yeah. Still, he measures it out. We've got a freight scale down there. And so he can measure the grain, get exactly the right amount that we need. And uh, and so it goes into this hopper. It's got two spline rollers here. Spline means that it has like raised spots on the outside edge of the roller. So they come together close, but they don't overlap. You want the grain to be cracked. You don't want it to be powdered. And uh, so it goes through here. This auger tube pulls it up from the hopper there, puts it into the hopper that's up above. While we're doing the grain, uh, 
the far kettle over here is the boil. And we're heating water in this so that the grain will come through here, drop in, and pump the water. This has got a screen in the bottom of it. It's like a drip coffee maker. Think of that. Good enough. Yeah, and uh, so we're we're blending the grain with the water. We let it sit there. We're changing starches to sugars, and uh, and then we'll. By the time this is done, this is drained, ready to be have something put in it, so the wort can be pumped over over to here, and then we start our boil process that includes adding. Uh, the hops at various stages, um, so it can do what it does. Uh, once we get done boiling it, then we are ready to transfer it to the fermenter. When we transfer it, uh, we have this wort chiller that has cold water. We chill water to go through it, let's say in the even plates, in the odd plates, in the wort chiller, Excuse me. As the beer, it's really close together, so it cools the, the beer's cooled off from boiling down. We want it to be 68 degrees. The water is around uh, 40 degrees. It gets the temperature, and it goes up to about 150. And that 150 water, we pump in and we put it into a tank that's in the back, and then we'll reuse that water that's preheated, uh, maybe for uh, washing tanks or uh, cleaning tanks, uh, but it's just preheated, so we save some uh, power that way. So once we get the, the word over to the tank, we add the yeast, uh, lock it up, make sure it'll be It'll be kept at the temperature that we want uh, during the process of fermenting, and uh, and then we'll do the same kinds of things in this 15 barrel tank as I was explaining in the 7 barrel tank. And, uh, this barrel holds it out. This one will hold two batches of beer, and that one just holds one. So, uh, this time of year, we can do it about once or twice a week. Um, as the spring and summer come along, uh, then we start using the 15, and we can have enough beer so that we don't run out, and we have enough beer for the case and the bottling and sales, sales going up. Okay, well, I think Let's it's time to try some beer. Some beer. There My go. favorite part. Well, tell me how it works. Right so, now you're filling over here. Yeah, this is sanitizer. We have a tub of sanitizer with a water pump down there. Got it. Draws it up in there. And then uh, we have these pneumatic pumps connected to an air compressor and the power batteries. That works the arm that pours the sanitizer back out in there, so we reuse so it, change it out. The sanitizer. Yeah, change it out every couple of days. And then uh, we have CO2. They get all the oxygen out of the bottles. And then... Oh, really? The it valve. sucks oxygen out? Okay. Yeah, it forces it out, and then that's the valve that has the beer. The tube that has the beer in the cooling. Because the oxygenization the oxygen in there would be great for the beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oxygen is the enemy. And then this is a sophisticated bottling part where it comes over to here. Why don't you show us yeah, what you so, here? Yeah, I have this little slide thing that helps move all the bottles. Okay. And then this is the capper. It's just a, it has a little magnet in there. So you put the cap in there, the bottle underneath, and just puts it right on there. It's nice tight. And then I uh, use this fancy glue there and put the labels on. Put the labels on. Where shall we start? Uh, might as well go light to dark. That's we, can, like. we can we uh, can start with the dosu wallops. There we go. Yeah. So that's a great name. 
Tell us about it. Okay. Uh, Dosey Wallops, obviously, well, maybe not obviously. It is a, a river that's on the Olympic Peninsula. It's an area that I used to go uh, hiking in uh, before the slide. And so you could drive all the way up to the federal campground and then there's all sorts of trails going up out of there. So anyway, this is a, it's a real light beer. Uh, it's a good session beer, it goes good with food. Well, and it, it's got this, this mellow, malty character that like, it's not filling, it's not heavy, it's not high alcohol, but it's really, really pleasant. One of the grains that I use helps that out. Right? I only got two questions. <laughs> <laughs> what shall we try next? Um, we could try the Mount Walker. It's this one, second one. Over. Uh, it's, it's another light colored beer. Um, we have changed it in the past couple of years so that it has a little more alcohol to it, um, but it still has a nice light flavor. And people are generally surprised that it has the alcohol in it that it does. Yeah, it's uh, really good flavor. Well, it does, and it's not cloudy like many happy vices. No, it's not a happy, it's a nail. Oh, so no. that's the difference between a happy vices is not the grain, it's the, the yeast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like the, uh, the hazy IPAs that yeah. they're making now. It's because they're using a I'm, mis I'm guessing, I don't know what yeast they're doing, but I'm guessing that they're using a yeast that uh, doesn't flocculate out of solution very quickly. Um, it's an Well, you can see yeast that's on the bottom of the bottle. It's true. You know, so, but it just takes longer and uh, it gives it that yeast flavor. Uh, it adds body to the IPA as well. But uh, anyway, ours, well, like we are trying to make as clear beers as we can. And so ours should be that. And you don't even filter. You yeah. use all the flavor. No, we don't, we don't filter. Awesome. So when, when you ferment it in the barrel, it, 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 it chilled before it goes into the barrel? It's yeah. cooled down to, before it, it goes into the fermenter, it's cooled down to 68 degrees. And then <clears throat> that's cooled down again so we can collect the yeast from it. Uh, it's cooled. Yeah, all the fermentation is done. And so then we cool it down further to 36 degrees. That way we can uh, transfer it over. It's, real, it's easier to transfer over. The, uh, CO2, when we're adding the CO2, will go into solution easier the colder the beer is. And it holds it longer. And, uh, and so, yeah, so it's cooled down to 36. Uh, in the bright tank, CO2 is added. So the CO2 goes into solution. And then it's still kept cold when it's going into the kegs. And then as soon as the kegs filled, it goes into the cooling room. And so there's no warming up period going to well, happen to that beer. I understand it. A lot of back rooms in grocery stores and liquor stores and such are room temp. Is it your beer stored in milk coolers? And we, coolers? we, yeah. We, we don't store. sell to anybody that won't keep our beer cold. And and uh, so the Safeways, the Albertsons, Central Markets, uh, they, they all have dairy areas. And so, and they let us keep our beer in there. And we're not the only beer in there. You know, there's other beers that aren't pasteurized and they're kept in those as well. Well, that's part of the reason that's a delicious beer, I think. Yeah. yeah. Everything sure. If, if they weren't kept cold, that'd be a real bad thing. Well, where shall we try next? Uh, okay. Um, let's just keep going across okay. and try the amber, Agapass amber. So the smoked amber, and the amber pass amber start out the same? They have the same recipe, but some of the grain has been adjusted. And so uh, the agate pass amber was one of my first beers that I produced. And uh, 
has a nice body to it. That is nice delicious. Color. Yeah. I have to tell you, there, this is beautiful because a lot of ambers are kind of mediocre, but this is beautiful. It's rich. It's velvety. It's got nice hops. There's almost like some kind of nut in there. I, I really like it. Good. Thank it's you. It's got a wider dimension in flavor than many of the ambers I've tasted. Okay, so then after the amber, we have another amber that is called Hood's Head. Hood's Head is another spot on, in the uh, Hood Canal. Uh, if you're crossing the bridge, going over to Jefferson County, you look over to the right, and there's a, it looks like an island, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. It's a head, and because it's still connected. Right, I see that. And yeah. if you look to... The part, the side of the island, or the side of the head that is toward the center of the Hood Canal, uh, there's a little rock sand spit that sticks out there, and there's a dragon on the top of that. That the people that work or live there uh, during the summer solstice, they have a party and they work on it. That was my interest in it, and uh, I also wanted to make an amber where. We've uh, used some smoked grain, and I have a, a gentleman that smokes it for us, and uh, he owns Crimson Cove, which is a smokehouse that uh, they do salmon, nuts, uh, cheeses. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really good stuff. They smoke our, our, uh, our grain for that beer, and then we add it to... The rest of the grains right along like we would anything else and uh, we end up with a pretty good product that uh, really in the grocery stores is doing really well this is a world-class beer my favorite soda and of course i had some last night yeah 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 exactly so right. we're done yeah i uh when i sell it to taverns that's one of the things I have to work with them on is to, for them to not think that it's going to be overpoweringly smoky. Some beers are, and, and I have to, have to convince them that this one's not. One glass. So, what shall we go through next? Uh, then we have the IPA, it's Gay Bob Bay IPA. Um, Again, the Bob Bay is, is part of the Hood Canal, and uh, and I've tried to name all my beers after different places on the canal. The Day Bob Bay is a, uh, an IPA that has a nice body to it. Um, that was one of the things that I wanted when I first designed it, was to make sure that I had an IPA that had a nice body to it. I didn't want the hops could be so overpowering that it would shy people away. Um, it's one of our most popular beers for people that come into the tasting room. We go through a lot of it. It's, it's a really nice, well balanced. The termination, it has a lot of complexity to it because it has a lot of different grains. Um, so the, it's a pretty complex IPA, and uh, the, the alcohol content is up in that one as well. It has a lot of grain in it, and to go with that extra grain, you have to have more hops to balance out that grain. To go with that grain. And so, um, so it does have a lot of hops in it. But because it has the grain going on, uh, yeah, and mine's an imperial IPA, not a double IPA. And so it's, and a double IPA is going to have double the amount of hops with the same amount of grain. And so it's just going to be really hoppy. And, uh, and this one's not. Everything about it is super nice.
It's, it's not sweet, but it's sweet. Not sugar sweet. Well, it's, it's yeah, it's got a rich grain flavor to it. There you go. And uh, and so it's just it's a big beer. So um, let's see. Next, we have the South Point Porter. We kind of we split our dark beers into two two halves of the year. Uh, the porter covers the fall and winter, and our stout covers the spring and summer. And uh, and so right now we're finishing up. Well, we're not finishing up. We still have a fair amount, um, but we we're in the middle of the porter, and uh, yeah, it uh, it's a nice beer. It's one of my favorites. Uh, when I'm in a mood for a dark beer, that's that's my go-to beer. Uh, yeah, it's not terribly roasted. You know, not over the top with the roasted grain. Um, the hops are backed off on it, so you're getting more of the mouthfeel of the of the grain, and uh, and then obviously you've got the color. So in the process of a porter versus stout. And for mine, the stout is an oatmeal stout, which means it has rolled oats in it, which what that does to the, for the beer is it gives it a mouthfeel that's nice and smooth. And uh, it's a kind of has a nice creamy flavor to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but with the rolled oats, it's just a nice, you know, it's a grain that that's what it does. You know, like how rice or rye gives it a kind of a spicy flavor. Rolled oats gives it a nice soft feel. Yeah. There is. And the next we have is the Bredelbeck Barley Wine. Now that one again, you know, it's got, it's a big beer. It's it's called the barley wine. It's not wine. It's a style of beer, and they're a pretty big beer. A lot of people make their barley wine so that they're very hoppy. Mine's not. Um, it's more of a, a big, smooth. Dark beer, not as dark as the porter. Elegant for being such a big beer. It, it ages well. I've aged this uh, barley wine for 12 years one time. And uh, I thought I lost some of the flavor during that time period because the yeast is still working in the beer during that time period. And so some of the flavor, the body uh, that was in the barley wine, I felt kind of went away. So I prefer my barley wine to be about four months old. It seems like when the alcohol is there, the body's there, and the flavor's there. And so that's my favorite time to be drinking the barley wine. My, my barley wine was meant to be a, my winter beer. Um, but one of my customers convinced me that if, if I made it in, in June, he would sell as much in June as he does in January. And so I said, okay, fine. So we, we gave it a shot, and we do. We sell sell it all year round, and the people that like barley wines will drink it in June just as, just as much as they will in January. And... Uh, so it's it's a nice beer to have around. It sure is. Now I forgot to bring my growl. I was going to blow that. Oh yeah, that's how we sell growlers. If people forget them, and they got to buy another one. What is this? Okay, the last beer that we have to taste today. We've I've left it for the end because. It's a mix of two of my beers. We've mixed the barley wine and the Dave Bob IPA. When I first started making it, I'd drink it after I got done brewing. 
and uh, I'd ask yep. the person working behind the, the tasting room counter to uh, give me a 50 50. And, uh, and so they'd pour half barley wine, half IPA, and, and hand it to me. Um, one of my customers complained that that was a really boring name for the beer. And so out of the people that were sitting at the counter, they came up with the name Bob Barley. And, uh, and that's how we got the name. And it goes well with the, grain, the two different beers that we put in it. I don't have to mix it by myself to get it wrong. Right. Well, I wouldn't mix it out. I drink all the mistakes. I can never remember the next day when I finally got it right. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But we have a system for uh, blending the two beers together. And so we can be very consistent in how we do it so we can make uh, more and more beer. Uh, and we've We've sold it in the taste room for quite a while. This year is going to be the first year that we're going to bottle it. And so uh, the person that does my labels, she was nice enough to come up with a, a label for us. And so it's a new label for a new beer that will be out in the stores uh, in the near future. No, I'm not going to do cans either. I've, I've always done bottles. And... I'm going to keep doing bottles. Um, I was talking to a gentleman that is a regional manager for a store. He said that Kitsap County, he's never seen any, so many stores that still have 22 ounce bottles. So we're a little unique in that respect. Um, we're selling more bottles now than we ever have. That's wonderful. You know, and uh, so I, I prefer drinking beer out of a bottle than I do a can. And uh, so, so that's one of the reasons why I do it. Uh, we're set up to do it that way, and so uh, that's what I'm. That's what I've chosen to do. mess with such high quality perfection? Yeah, and I. I think people that like beer are going to, I mean, beer's been around for a while. <laughs> Scenario. Yeah, so I suspect it will be fine.